Francois, if we think about Iraq, it's so much in the news today, and the news often is not very good. Now, you were privileged to have been in Baghdad before all this crisis happened that is happening there now. Tell us a little about your experience in Baghdad. One of the highlights was my visit to an Adventist church, just two blocks away from the Tigris River. And that's where I met this lady with a different nose. You know, last time I told you, I'll, I'll tell you more about her. So I asked her, excuse me, but uh, you know, you have to be tactful, especially when it comes to ladies. I, I said, your nose is a little different uh, to the other noses. That's not very tactful. How should I have put it? it? <laughs> you should not have put it at all. <laughs> but anyway, I'm so glad I did. So she said, I'm a, an Assyrian from Mosul, Nineveh. And then they invited me to show you. Shows you. Now, what if she sees this program? How is she going to react? You know, I saw it at Loma Linda when we did lectures there, and I met them, but, but she's still very kind to me. Well, I think that could change in the near future. <laughs> but then they invited me to their lovely home in Baghdad. And then they told me the story of how Saddam Hussein stopped with his limousine in front of the house, sent the driver in and asked if they would entertain the president for a while. And he came in and he was very kind to them. And he said, this is just a courtesy visit. And since that time, at the very church, of Baghdad, that's a beautiful edifice. He sent Christmas gifts to the children. So some people are popular, some are not popular. But concentrate on the people that appreciate you, Walter, and me. Let's not concentrate on all our enemies. <laughs> OK, so <clears throat> the preaching of Jonah had some fruit. And if you check on the internet, you'll find different Assyrian pockets, churches, in the Middle East. I was so surprised when I did research in this direction. OK, now we come to a very interesting place in Iran. I'm going to put a few things together, and eventually you'll, you'll get the entire picture. This is the tomb of Mordecai and Esther. You speak about Mordecai in the gate. Yes, but this was in Iran. This wasn't Iraq, right? You've now, yeah. You've now well, moved to the yes, neighboring to, country. To the neighboring country. Tell me about your, your idea of uh, Mordecai in the gate. Well, Mordecai is a type of the end time people because there will always be a Haman who wants to hang you on the gallows. Have you experienced that, Walter? Uh, there are many Hamans in this world today. And, uh, well, the gate is a very interesting concept because the gate stands for judgment. And there was a judge called Mordecai. He was one of the judges. So, in other words, he was a man who distinguished between right and wrong. Mm. But he ended up on the wrong side of decisions by other entities who wanted to uh, misapply the law and to turn that which is right against the person who is doing the right. There are always people who hate people that tend or try to do what is right. And so there was a marvelous reversal by the interposition of God in that event. And as you know, this beautiful lady, Esther, was very much involved in that story. But I'm sure you're going to get to it. Yeah. But here we have the tomb of Esther and Mordecai in Hamadan. The ancient name was Ekbatana. Ekbatana was the capital of. The now, how do they know that this is the tomb, or is this just uh, it's supposition? A, no, no, this is logic. Remember, they had their winter palaces in Shusan, 
When the Persian emperors moved to Ekbatana, uh, the, the summer palace. Yes, but I know, I know that Esther and Mordecai were buried there. Because she was the queen. So they shifted. They yes, but is there a name which says that this is Mordecai's grave? Yes. I went inside and I took some more pictures. But this is where they were buried. And this is a very old tradition. So archaeologically, there is evidence that there was an Esther and that there was a Mordecai. Yes. Yes. And what I love about archaeology, it, it gives the Bible message a, an additional color. And you appreciate it just a little more. So they commuted from the summer palace to the, to the winter palace. This to me was an interesting discovery because I was wondering now, oh, how come they were buried here? So while they were living or working at the summer palace, they died and they were buried here. And it's, it's more scenic as, as, as well. So this is Susan. And this is a very interesting site, a very interesting site. And this is where archaeologists discovered some valuable Bible stuff. And uh, we were in the Louvre, and we walked through some the, the, the Persian gallery with all the beauty and art, etc., to give us an idea of the life Esther lived. Those were magnificent civilizations, Francois. Yeah, tremendous. And the typological applications of the story have direct implications for the time in which we are living. Because this very story as it unfolded there will be repeated in history. There will again be a decree concerning worship. False worship versus true worship. And it's interesting that an individual such as Haman should be so puffed up as to basically demand worship because wherever he went, everybody had to bow down to him. Except Mordecai uh, was obedient to a commandment which says, you shall not bow down because you shall bow down to the Lord your God and to him only. Hmm. Now, it's one thing to be courteous. It's interesting that the, the English word for when a lady is courteous before a king is curtsy. Uh, that's one thing, to be courteous. But to bow down in an act of worship, that is presumption. And this is where the conflict will come in. So at the end of time, when morality will be legislated and people be asked to bow down to a false system. If you refuse to do that, you will be the target of the ire of humanity. And that is when Haman will rise up and build the gallow to get rid of such people. But this is a promise. This is a promise by God that he will intervene on a personal level. You give me hope, Walter. Now, Francois, I, I don't want to be presumptuous here, but could we, could we almost say that uh, Esther is a type of the church at the end, and that the king who holds out his scepter to her is a type of Christ? so that we have the church and we have the bride. And she pleads for the circumstances which will lead to the death of all of God's people. And the monarch intervenes on her behalf. Uh, not because she is worthy, because remember, if you go into the king and he didn't hold out the scepter, it meant that... Uh, you would be exterminated, right? And by the way, she said to her uncle, Mordecai, I haven't spoken to him for 30 days. So maybe there was a little uh, tension. <laughs> yes. Okay. And he held out the scepter. Isn't that a, a symbol Beautiful. of God's grace? Beautiful. And the scepter is always held 
held out for, for sinners to come and touch it. So and she bowed down to the king. So here again in typology, we have the issue of God versus his people or and his people. So it is, it is a case of the watch care and what happened there, the reversal of a decree, will again, I believe, take place at the end of time and there will be a reversal of a decree. And those that seek the demise of God's people will themselves end up on the very gallows, typologically speaking, and that they have prepared. And this is authentic. They discovered at six different sites the name of Mordecai, 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 in that area. So the Bible is trustworthy. So if the type is trustworthy, the antitype will also be trustworthy? Yes. By the way, Nebuchadnezzar met his wife at Hamadan, at Batana, mountainous area, and then they moved down to a very flat area. This was Babylon. Yes. So he built her the hanging gardens of Babylon. So he built the mountain for her. Yes. I, I think he went to his lawyer and said, I want to divorce this lady. And this lawyer said, man, it's going to cost you too much. Rather build her. <laughs> build her a garden. It, you say it's worthwhile building a mountain for your lady than rather than face the other consequences. Yes, yes, rather, well, so, gentlemen, uh, <laughs> <laughs> build them out. I, I love the story of the Bible. So what happened at Shushan, besides all oh, of these interesting historic man, things? I've, I've got such a lot of stuff on this place. Uh, for instance, in my research, I, I have, I, I, was, I took pictures of the relief where Ashurbanipal destroyed Shushan and it shows the war, etc., and all the details. There are such a lot of archaeological stuff on this place, but I prefer the Bible side of it Esther, Azurus, Nehemiah, Ezra, and the story that happened. Now, there. in spite of all the critics, isn't it amazing that those names are still to be found on those stones? Yeah, although I still want to take you to Iran one day, <laughs> while I'm still a young man. <laughs> yes, while you still have the energy. <laughs> yes. Now, Daniel had a vision in chapter 9. He was, he says, I was in Shusan. So he was in this place. Yes. And uh, you can visit his tomb. I've been there. And the day when we were there, there was a goat. <laughs> it reminded me of chapter 9. This is the Ulai River. Oh, it's a beautiful story, the story of Daniel. So there you've got his tomb. Okay, Walter, so Esther and Mordecai must have died at Ekbatana, not Shusan, where Daniel was buried. And uh, archaeology helps us to appreciate the Bible a little more. Were you actually at Daniel's tomb? Yes, yes. I went in there. It's, it's quite an interesting place to Again, visit. how do they know that that is Daniel's tomb, Francois? It's, it's an old tradition. Now, tradition is not always correct, but this has been going on for a long time. And when I visited Iran, the guide, he was a professor like you, and he, he told me till recently they had 100,000 Jewish Jews living in Iran. So they their presence was there, and uh, when you check the, the internet, the tomb of Esther and Mordecai is still precious to the Jews, and they still want to visit the place. So okay. this is authentic. If you could read from Jeremiah 29, 10 to 14. And thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Those are very nice words. You know, these are wonderful words to a lot of people sitting in exile. 
I'm going yeah. to give you a future and I'm going to give you hope. The and Lord then, has always got something good to say to people in need. And I remember that Daniel studied these words and he refers to this prophecy of Jeremiah about the 70 years as he was studying it. And he fasted for three weeks praying about this same prophecy. And on the last day, it was a Sabbath, the Lord revealed to him what is going to happen. And interesting, it was also on a Sabbath that John, on the Isle of Patmos, received a vision, the vision of... My friends, well, it says there in the book of Revelation, I was in vision on the Lord's day. And uh, it's interesting that the churches, and particularly Catholicism, claims that that was Sunday. Now, as far as I can read my Bible, if I read Isaiah chapter 58, for example, it says to call the Lord's Day honorable, and he's referring to Sabbath and not to Sunday. So, you know, there are a lot of issues in this. How do you know it was a, a Sabbath, that it was a Saturday, the Lord's Day? What definition do we have in the Bible that the Lord's Day is anything other than the Sabbath day? None. You're right. And the fact that Daniel also received his visions on a Sabbath, that makes it easier to believe that the Lord's Day that uh, John experienced was also the Sabbath. So God chose the so Sabbath. So one is the key to the other, so the days are the same. Yes. You cannot understand Revelation without the knowledge of the book of Daniel. Chapter 29 verse 12 says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. These are all promises. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And then this promise, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. Okay, tell me. To which prophet is Jeremiah referring? The future deliverance of Israel. Yes, well, he's talking about the end time deliverance. Yes, Isaiah said it's going to happen. So he, he fills up, he adds to what uh, Isaiah said. So type will meet anti type. Yes. Now, I need to tell you this interesting story. Cyrus was born at Egbatana. 200 years before his birth, Isaiah said his name would be Cyrus. We spoke about that last time. Yes, yes. and you asked me to just uh, elaborate on it. So, then, remember it was Sayacharis that joined Nabopolassar and Nebuchadnezzar to destroy uh, Nineveh, and then his son, Astaeus, became king. He was not a very good king. So the oracles told him that a boy, a male child, will be born into your kingdom, but as soon as he is born, his name will be called Cyrus, and you have to kill him, because he is going to overrule and destroy you and capture your country. So we have a, a parallel with, with Herod. Yes. Who also wanted to kill the, the one that was going to rule, who was going to be the king. Yeah. So one morning he, he got the good news, according to his daughter, Mandane. Dad, I've got a baby child, and his name is called Cyrus. Oh, <coughs> then he recalls the oracles which told him, you've got to kill that baby. Walter, how can a, a grandpa kill his newborn baby? Uh, I wonder what went through his mind. He, he couldn't do it. So he asked his minister of finance and the head of the army to do the job for him. You see, Walter, the birth of Cyrus is so important for the biblical story. 
because he's a type of Christ. And what happened to him happened to Moses and happened to Christ. So here we have additional information concerning Cyrus. I went to the sites, I did research, and then I came across Herodotus, and I was looking for this. And a lady from America, a doctor, gave me this information, and she gave me the book. So here you can read about what the man himself said about his work. And then we can proceed with the story according to Herodotus telling us about this saga that took place at this very place, Ekbatana. Okay. So it seems as if, uh, as it says in this book that you got, that Herodotus seems to have traveled extensively around the ancient world. Nearly all of these territories were directly under the Persian Empire, conducting interviews, collecting stories for his book, and then he quotes the following. This is the showing forth of the inquiry of Herodotus. He's using the third person there. So that neither what has come to be from man in time might become faded, nor that great and wondrous deeds, those shown forth by the Greeks and those by the barbarians, might be without their glory. And together with all this, also through what cause they warred with each other. So to me, the most important part of his history was that on Cyrus, because this is Bible-related. Now, in Egypt, I visited a very interesting place. It's called Ochi Renchus. Now, it comes from the word fish, Ichthus. And uh, the early Christians used Ichthus, the five letters, to give to explain the names of Christ, Iosos, Christos, etc., Huios, Soter. And uh, this place is called Ochi Reinchus. It means the fish with a sharp nose. Funny name. But what happened here, they wrote parchments, manuscripts, and then they would dump it into the dunes. The wind would cover it, and they kept on doing this for many centuries. And why would they dump it in the dunes? I think this was providence. I believe this was providence. Do you think when it was old hat for them, they, they dumped them? Yes. And, and you can check this on internet. It is fascinating. And then a farmer, just like what happened at uh, Yucharit, a farmer discovered this, ordinary peasant. And here they got Old Testament, they got New Testament, and then they also excavated Herodotus. And uh, this is a fragment. Okay. So, you know, I, I love this. Here you've got his story so many years ago, and here they say, well, look at this. There was a Herodotus. And his history is reliable. His history is reliable. So I believe what he writes about the birth and the history of Cyrus. So when he wrote about Cyrus, and you said that uh, there was this command to go and kill little Cyrus, uh, what actually happened that he didn't get killed? Well, this is interesting. So. And you, 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 you see it on paintings as well. So he sent his, his commander of the army, Harp Argus, to his daughter and her husband. And he said, I've come to kill the baby. The king said, I must kill the baby. Can you imagine the, the trauma when he took that little baby from the mother a few days old? She was not uh, too pleased with her grandfather, I Oh, assume. with her own, own father. Oh, her own father. Own father. Yeah. Seacheres, and then Asteacheres, and then the daughter. So what happened? When he took that baby, according to Herodotus, he couldn't kill the child. <laughs> Here's the baby crying. He couldn't kill it. So what he did, he gave the child, he went to the, the royal shepherd, 
Mitradates. He said, Mitradates, on command of the king, you are to kill this baby. So the poor shepherd, he only had a few years education. And then he took this baby to his wife. His wife's name is Mandane. And this is all recorded in Herodotus. Yes, I, I mean Spauko. Her name is Spauko. Mandane is the daughter of Astaeus, the mother of Cyrus. And when he came there, according to Herodotus, Spauko told him, you know, our baby died. So what they did, they changed the clothes, and instead of continuing to call him Cyrus, they call him Henry Stober. So this little child got a new name, and a surname, Henry Stober. So little Henry was brought up in the home of Mitradates, but he was brilliant. Remember, the Bible predicted his coming. And I suppose the exiles mourned the death of the future deliverer. The Facebook and the emails went out. Cyrus is dead. So can you imagine the exiles? What's going to happen? But you know, Walter, when God says it's going to happen. Then it will happen. Even if they tell you death thwarted his plans. No. What the Bible says, believe it. So they buried the, Mitra, the child of Mitradates, and little Henry Stober grew up. And he was brilliant. Herodotus tells us that uh, they, they, he played with the royalties, you know, the royal children. And they chose him to be the leader. He was appointed king, and they played a game king, king. You know, the girls played doll, doll. But they, and then he, he, he disciplined one of the children that was disobedient to him, the king. And this came to the ears of Astaeus, the king of Ecbatana, the king of the Medes. And he said to this little fellow, how dare you discipline one of our royal children? Yes. And then he said, your majesty, any good ruler has to use discipline to be successful. Now, I have a question there. If Cyrus is a type of Christ, do you mean to tell me that any good ruler has to have discipline in his kingdom? In other words, you cannot have a king without a law, because what standard would he have to rule by then? Well, this is brilliant. Thank you. So do you think that the antitype also has a law, and that this law is immutable, it stands, and any transgression of the law will have the consequences that come along with it? I love this insect. Thank you. So he realized that this is not Henry Stober. This is Cyrus. And the oracles told me to kill this child. But at that stage, according to Herodotus, Mandana, his daughter, she, she pestered her father every day. Why did you kill my child? He couldn't kill that son. So he sent him away to Anshan. And there this young child grew up to become one of the greatest rulers of antiquity. When I was in uh, Iran, they presented me with a beautiful book on the life of Cyrus. Are you telling me that they banned him to another place? Yes. As a consequence of a death decree, yes. wasn't Jesus also taken to another place as a consequence of a death decree? He went down to Egypt. And uh, the prophecies say, out of Egypt I called my son. I love this. <laughs> so out of Anshan, the antitype was called. That's right. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I visited this place and I, this came to my mind that the story relived itself again. Uh, now, let's look at this interesting account, the Nabonidus Chronicle. Uh, King Astaeus called up his troops and marched against Cyrus. 
So he, he, he tried to. He, he wanted to kill kill Cyrus, king of Anshan. He became a king, and he met him in battle. And what happened in the battle? Let's consult the Nabonidus. Remember, we spoke about Nabonidus. Yes. He had the religious side of Babylon. That's right. And Belshazzar had the political side. You know, that to me was tremendous. That's a tremendous thought you brought out. It fits into the picture, the antitype. So you can just quickly read this story of Cyrus. The, he, so this stands in the chronicles of Nabonidus yeah, now. Yeah. We, we just looked at the, the tablet and just read what the tablet says. And Cyrus marched against the country, Ekbatana, the royal residence he seized, silver, gold, other valuables of the country, Ekbatana he took as booty and brought to Ansan. You know, God said he was going to do this. The devil read the prophecy and he told Astaeus, kill that child. When God says it's going to happen, nobody can thwart his plans. Now, can you just repeat some of the characteristics of Cyrus, a type of Christ? So he had the same experience as in his youth as a baby. He came, he conquered Babylon. The antitype will also conquer Babylon. He set the captives free. And uh, it's interesting that... Cyrus was actually one of the first to propagate human rights. Now, human rights can be uh, positive and human rights can be negative, depending which criterion you apply to those human rights. So, yes, human rights, when they are based on, on righteousness, are a tremendous asset. Hmm. But if they are based on the opposite of righteousness, then they can be a curse. Now, if we look at human rights today, there are many human rights in the manifest of human rights which are very, very positive. You have a right to this, you have a right to life, you have a right to property, you have a right to... Uh, freedom of expression, you have all of these great rights. But then uh, you also have rules like you have a right to abortion, you have a right to all kinds of other things which are contrary to the law of God. So I assume that when Cyrus, who was a type of Christ, when he issued his first human rights manifest, where he restored lands, where he set captives free, that they were in harmony with good principles. Now, what I like about him, I visited the site, the ruins of his, his palace at Pasar Gade. All the messages are written in three different cuneiform languages, Elamite, Persian, and Babylonian, in respect you know, for his neighbors, so everybody could read it. And he proclaimed religious liberty. He said, let us allow people to worship as they want to worship, because there's always religi religious wars. But he was the man who said, let everybody be convinced in his own mind. Now, it's interesting, whenever there was such a, uh, an act of liberation in history, then you have this this uh, human rights issue coming up. The French Revolution is an interesting one. Mm. And we've been there, remember? Yes, where you also Paris. had the manifest of human rights, but it was to take the place of the Ten Commandments. They even issued it on two tablets, or in the form of two tablets. But uh, later, Napoleon was also fascinating because uh, he also proclaimed religious liberty. And set the captives free, particularly the Jewish nation at that particular time. So uh, there's some interesting parallels in history here. Oh, it's a, it's a great subject. <laughs> when uh, 
Alexander the Great came to his tomb, says the history. He bows down and brought honor to Cyrus, to the greatest ancient ruler in history. No, no ruler ever compared uh, with Cyrus. Now, you mentioned the birth of Cyrus and they wanted to kill him. Now, when Moses was born in 15... You have a parallel with that Moses. Yeah, that Moses, yes. <laughs> he said, kill all the babies, throw them in the Nile. And this is the tomb of uh, that Moses the first. But Moses survived. So if you study the birth of Moses and you study the birth of Cyrus, which are types of Christ, when you come to the New Testament, you have to expect that when he would be born, <laughs> there would be a decree. Isn't that fascinating? So we have all these parallels, and uh, you can be pretty sure that the Messianic prophecies are reliable because they are even rooted in ancient history confirmed by archaeology. Yeah, and archaeology, archaeology even gives the names that Moses the first. <laughs> I love archaeology, Walter. It's such a marvelous book. And here we have the science of archaeology that helps us in our unbelief. When I get to these sites, I get so excited and I say, thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for the signs of archaeology. So, Walter, what happened? <laughs> when you study the types, Christ becomes more precious. If you could read, I think this is the greatest statement on salvation by grace in the book of Isaiah. It, uh, it speaks of what, it, what you've got to pay to enter eternal life, what you must do to inherit the new Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 45, verse... 13, and just comment as you go along. Bring out the soteriological aspects of that verse. I have raised him up in righteousness. Ah. Now, friends, what is righteousness? It has to do with law. And the word right means doing what is right. Yes. So righteousness means purity of character. Yes. Okay, I've raised him up in righteousness. And Can you will... apply this to Christ? Absolutely. Okay. And I will direct all his ways. Can you? He performed his father's will, absolutely. He shall build my city. Okay, and... he'll build my city. <clears throat> is Christ going to prepare a place for us. Yes. And so Jerusalem? Cyrus is doing the same things as the Lord will do. So he's a type. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when I come again, because in my father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, unless of course you have a new translation, then you only get uh, a room. And I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city. Christ is building this, the city. And let my exiles go free. Is this what Christ is doing to exiles like you and me? Absolutely. And it's interesting to me that uh, the words here, my, etc., are capitalized in this Bible. Not for price nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. So salvation is the free gift of God. And you cannot pay for it. There's nothing that you can do to earn it. You can only accept it. Now, Walter, let's look at the monetary situation here. To travel from Babylon on the, the Fertile Crescent, man, it's a long way. It's a very expensive journey. So Sari said, listen, listen, dear exiles, <laughs> I'll pay for you. And God pays for us. He helps us from Babylon to the new Jerusalem. So he wants us to separate from Babylon, to come out, 
He'll finance the journey. I like the, that phrase. <laughs> and then he will bring you to the new Jerusalem. You know what I find interesting? Whenever the Bible speaks of Jerusalem, you never go down to Jerusalem. You always go up to Jerusalem. It's always an upward journey. You go down to Jericho, yes, but you, Jericho was a cursed city. But you always go up to Jerusalem. So when you come out of Babylon, you go up to Jerusalem. It's like Peter's ladder. You add to your faith virtue. And you add to your virtue knowledge. And then you add self-control and all the issues until eventually you get to agapeo, heavenly love. So the journey from where we are to what we can become is an upward journey. And if it weren't for this righteousness that covered us, then uh, we would be blemished all the way. But in spite of the fact that we are blemished, if we allow Christ to work within our hearts, he will change our dispositions and our tendencies so that we are actually on an upward road. But wherever you are on that upward road, you will never say you have arrived until you get to the city. And we're not in the city yet, Francois. And then we're you carry on eating city. leaves. <laughs> we're not in the city yet. So I like it, uh, one author put it this way. It is not the occasional good deed, nor the occasional misdeed, that determines our stature in Christ. It is the tendency of the journey. What a hopeful <laughs> statement. It's a beautiful, beautiful thought, yes. And you know, he paid for the journey. It must have cost him millions and, or billions of dollars. And only 50,000 accepted freedom. The invitation. So there was yeah. no, there was no uh, massive crowd storming <laughs> the gates. Yeah. Wasn't it the same in, in Noah's day? There was not really a massive crowd storming towards the ark. No traffic jam. <laughs> no traffic jam. Yeah. So on Calvary, Christ paid the price for us, Walter, to get us from here to the new Jerusalem. And he paid dearly. He paid with his life. I love this portion. I see Christ in the history of Cyrus. Well, we, we looked at... Uh, the destruction of Nineveh in a previous lecture. It's, it's so wonderful. And uh, we've been to Lebanon on a few occasions. I've been there many times. I remember the very first time I got there, my father won a Bible competition and my, my mother didn't want to go with him. And I was in my first year in theology. And, you know, the old people, they, you, a child never argued with them. He said to me, you must come. You must go. I'll give you the ticket, but you get the money. But I've just started theology. We had a baby. He insisted that I should go. It cost me 200 rand for the land arrangements in those days. <laughs> that was a lot of money in those days. And that was my first visit to, now it's a university to... Uh, and what year was that? That was in 1966 when my child was born. And I had to leave that little baby. Now, I remember my first massive salary that I received from the university was 137 rand a month. Now, that was a few years later. So if you add inflation, then your, your journey must have cost you one month's salary, about. <laughs> So I was at that university, and it was tremendous. The war was going on. I don't think the war ever stopped at Lebanon, in, in the Middle East. There's always a war. As Daniel says, war to the end, Daniel 9.27. And when people say, are you really going to Israel, to the Middle East? I said, yes. But what about the war? And I said, well, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. The war is always there. And once I was on the Sea of Galilee when his bula hit Tiberius, and I saw how people panic, and 
That was a tremendous experience, man. I was there. Remember in Bethlehem once we were there and there was an explosion. <laughs> I have a picture of that explosion. Yes. Yeah. But I never forget the visit. They didn't put any utensils on the table. We had to eat like them. That was in 66. My subsequent visits say they had a knife and a fork and a spoon. But you had to eat with the falafel, you know, and uh, the pita bread. And <laughs> I've got sweet memories of Lebanon. So I've been there many times. And I wanted to take you and Henry Stober there again. But uh, it didn't work out. Maybe next time. So let's, let's continue. Uh, this place is called Nar el Kalp. Nar means, can you remember? No. River, river, river. And Kelp yeah. Yeah. is the dog. There was, uh, th there's a mountain there. It looks like a dog, as if he runs into the ocean. And all the great uh, warriors in ancient times, when they came there, they left the story of their victory. So we've got Tatmos the third there and Esar Hadon. In this picture, I'm looking at Esar Hadon. By the way, this is interesting. Uh, I read a book by Oli Burke speaking about Saddam Hussein and Nineveh. And what happened there, they discovered his palace and his arsenal. And Saddam Hussein removed 400 families from the area which is against Islamic law. Yeah. But he was the boss. And then they carried on with the excavations and then they found that this was Esar Hadon, this was his arsenal, and I was there. I stood next to one of the big Syrian bulls. We took pictures there. So the Bible speaks about him. He, he was the son of Sennacherib. The Bible tells exactly what would happen. And it happened. I confirmed it through archaeology. So I was so delighted when I saw him at Nar el Kalp for the first time. But, uh, and I've been there many times, and I, every time I get there, I get there, I ask them, please take me to the inscriptions of Nebuchadnezzar. Because I read this in an ancient document. He left his his. His, his inscriptions, yeah, he left it there. And they couldn't help me because they always have war. And one year, I, I kept on praying. And one year, I got a, a very clever guide. Her name is Francois. I, says, I said to her, you know, I'm also Francois, but not Francois. Anyway, and then I got a, got a professor, Professor Khoury, from the Middle East University, and uh, we went and searched for the inscription. Because I read it, must be there. But it was difficult. They lowered me down from the top over the bridge, and we got down. It was all covered with grass, etc., trees, and everything was removed. One would expect that. that uh Great archaeological finds like this should be made prominent. There should be, you know, some form of protection for whatever there is. Nothing. Nothing. No? It shows you when you fight, you lose the real values of life. They were fighting with Israel all the time and amongst themselves, you know, the Hezbollah, etc., etc. And their history was neglected. And Walter, I kept on looking for this place. And I found it. I shouted, Eureka, when I came there. And then I came back to South Africa and I said, Walter, come with me. <laughs> and you came with me. You are so obedient when I ask you to do something, Walter. Not always. I sometimes say, let no man, including you, tell me my duty. Okay, but at the end, your wife, Sonica, and myself, you know, gains the victory, gain the victory. <laughs> So, you saw what I saw. And here we get the story. What the Bible says about Nebuchadnezzar. Besieging Tyre for 13 years. Destroy the city. And then he was bankrupt. He went back to, <laughs> to Babylon. 
to generate some more money. And he came back. He came back. So on this, uh, Nari al Kalb, he tells the story. But the wonderful thing is that the story is repeated. Like the Assyrian king list, which was discovered at Nineveh, at Korsabat, was also discovered by Siegfried Horn at the church in Baghdad. He was visiting there, and two little boys of the, the, the uh, Sendalin, the uh, missionary, played with two pieces of stone, and he, he looked at it, he put it together, and it was a, another copy of the Assyrian king list. So somehow the Bible duplicates so that we get the truth. If you lose the one, he's got another. So this is a now huge... Some people <coughs> accuse the Bible of uh, repetition or plagiarism. And uh, you know, in some of the, the writings you have exact repetitions of what, for example, says what it says in uh, the book of Isaiah. Now, isn't it interesting that if you actually have the source, well, why should you not be able to quote the source? So, if one prophet builds upon another prophet, it just improves the picture. And uh, if people would, would realize this, they wouldn't have the philosophy as they have today that you can take the Old Testament and say, oh, that belongs to Old Testament times. I'm not really interested in the characteristics of what God was like there. I'm only interested in the New Testament then you lose the continuity. You will not be able to understand any of the prophecies because the book of Revelation without the book of uh, Daniel is a lock without a key. Yeah. So archaeology repeats important stuff. The Bible does the same. I, I, I like this. Man, I was at uh, New York one time and there was a huge... Uh, front page article, they discovered clay tablets from Babylon. <laughs> and uh, I said to myself, I must see this brand new stuff. So I went there and I said to the uh, person Guys. working, I, uh, what do you call a person the working? Curator? In, no, no. Uh, the museum, he works in the museum, just an ordinary, he was in charge of that specific floor. Uh -huh. I said, I, I, I need to see those uh, play tablets. He says, no, you're not allowed to see it. <laughs> I said, please speak to the curator. Man, sometimes these people are so polite, so I went to the curator and he brought this to me. <laughs> and I said, can I hold it? He says, no, you're not allowed. I said, just for the picture friend of mine was there with me. So I stood with those clay tablets. They still have to be deciphered. Well, I think we can expect some more truth coming from the clay tablets. By the way, they have, there are two million clay tablets and they've only translated 40,000. So we can expect... 40,000 out of two million. Yes. So, uh, Do you I'm think there are more truths to be unraveled out of the Bible? Truth is progressive. And the more skeptic we become, the more evidences God gives us to look at. So at this stage, they've located four places in Lebanon. I've been to two and you've been to two, but there's, there are two more. And uh, this is part of my dream to take you and Walter St uh, and uh, take you and uh, Henry Stober to these sites. It's a very safe place. You don't lose more than a hundred people a day by war, etc. Maybe you will be able to escape it. <laughs> now, at this one specific relief, you see Nebuchadnezzar with a line. Now, Walter, can you relate this to one of Daniel's prophecies? Well, Babylon is likened unto a lion. And uh, it's interesting that uh, the critics said there, there were no lions in that area until, of course, they 
discovered all those ancient stones of the Assyrians. And there's that library in the British Museum of the Assyrians hunting the lions. Yes. So again, the Bible is authenticated. Now, those lions have all been eradicated there, and now you have to travel to Africa to see them. But looking at those reliefs, I saw that the lions were somewhat smaller than the African lions because you have the individuals in, in hand-to-hand combat with these lions. But uh, fascinating, yes, the lion was a symbol of Babylon. And uh, I took a picture once in Petra, where they had the lion with eagle wings. That was a tremendous discovery. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Walter. The Please. Bible really uses the imagery of the day. Yeah. Now. I believe the inscriptions and the reliefs are located in very sophisticated places where people walked. So Nebuchadnezzar built this and he had this inscription at prominent places. And this is tremendous. For instance, Nar el Kelp. There were feet walking there. So they saw it and they read it. The message was there. And uh, this helps us to appreciate the Bible just a little more. And the sites had symbolic meaning. Do you want to add something to this, Walter? The Babylonians are good at advertising. Well, the Babylonians are advertising in this time as well. Walter, after going to church one Sabbath at uh, the university, we were invited by a very friendly family. And after gossiping about uh, the college, the university, <laughs> I asked them, now listen, we've been to Nar el Kelp. Do, do you know of any other sites where we can see Nebuchadnezzar's inscriptions? Oh, and I was so glad when they told us. And we got a driver, and it took the entire day. He lost his way a thousand times, but eventually... We got there. He almost took us up to the cedars, and uh, you can see the snow as he was trying to locate this specific place called Wadi Briza. By the way, <coughs> the Germans first published the script. They translated it, and you can read it there. But right now, there's a scholar, uh, Rico, Rico, I've forgotten the surname. She's a Spanish scholar. Yeah, archaeologist. And uh, she published a book with pictures. So at my next birthday, Father's Day, or birthday, Walter, if, if you can tell my wife to buy me that book, I'll be so happy. So some more info is coming in. It's there. We just have to get hold of it. But if our readers... Viewers want to get the, that book, buy it and see how archaeology confirms the scriptures. So, in our search, we can remember, <laughs> we asked them all along the way, please, what he brings the inscription, Nabukuduri Usar, Nebuchadnezzar. So, we got these four people. And they took us up with they, this tractor and this trailer. Yes, they got us there. So on both sides of the road, you have this. In two cuneiform uh, languages, the new and the old. So Nebuchadnezzar wanted to make sure that everybody would read this. This, Walter, is so important. And when I got back to South Africa, I sent this to my professor in uh, Sumerian. He couldn't decipher it because there's some word and tear there, and I took it to Pretoria University. They couldn't help me. And then I think it was on my 80th or 90th or 100th birthday, I got this book, Annette, this lady, Ancient Near Eastern Text. And I went through it, and here was the Wadi Breezer inscription. So we can only share a little, but let's share it. It's, it's tremendous that the Lord led us to this place. Now, this is not a very famous tourist destination, Walter. 
people don't come here, but we had to come here. But I remember yeah. looking at that and finding it very hard to see the inscription. And uh, your eyes basically have to get too used to it, and then eventually you do see the inscription. And I remember taking some slides where you can actually still read what it says there. Yeah. It's a pity. Now, what they would, didn't protect this in some way. Would you like to read the statement from ancient Near Eastern text? He says, I erected a stella showing me as the everlasting king. Beside my statue as king, I wrote an inscription mentioning my name. Ram reminds you of? The king of Babylon wanting to be like the Most High and everlasting king. And uh, does the Bible say that he erected the stela, an uh, image of him? Of himself, absolutely, the Bible uh, says so. So I cannot tell you how excited I was when we made this discovery and we read the, eventually the story. So what people think is uh, mythology is actually historic fact. It's so sure, Walter and I. I can recommend this book to our viewers, please, five minutes a day. Just read it and see what happens to you. And those worthies that bowed down to that statue or refused to buy, bow down to that statue? You know, that they history were... history will be repeated. Yeah, they were health reformers and they went to church on a Sabbath, Walter. It's very interesting. <laughs> so it was a pleasure to be with you at this... I think this to me was the greatest discovery we've ever made because it confirms the book of Daniel. What an unbelievable moment. And uh, this, this is one of your pictures. You can see some of the inscriptions there. Yes. Walter, I want to go back to this place with, uh, with a new... Big, do you want to see whether that inscription is still there after these years? It might be gone now. Yeah, but we'll have the, new, the book, the new book on this. The Germans did this, but this was added to the Germans, the new research, where we, you can read. And they've got a way, those inscriptions that had some wear and tear on it, they had a way of... Enhancing them. Yes, the and, enhancing and then you can read it. And, and we need to get that book. I think more interesting facts will be revealed. <laughs> Walter, you know, I was holding up my shoes, but you don't see it. You must try and see it. It's, it's, it's brand new shoes, man. Yes. And uh, when I put it on this morning, especially for this, uh, this do, presentation... Do you think people will concentrate on the shoes, Francois? Yeah, what I want to tell you about new shoes, you know... Especially ladies like to buy new dresses, etc. We men also appreciate it. But in Greek, you've got two words for new. One of these words you find in Revelation, where you find it only there, where it speaks of a new earth and a new Jerusalem. It's new in quality. It hasn't been there before. It is different. It's like uh, metals that were developed with the space travels. And we are going to see new stuff in heaven. And I'm so glad that John, well, his Greek wasn't too good, but man, he wrote so beautifully. And he brought out a few good things in his, in his Greek, which I appreciate. Kainos is the word for new in the book of Revelation. We will have new eyes. Is the word there also kainos? Kainos, yes. Can you, can you imagine new eyes? Can I still be improved, Walter? I think, Francois, that biologically speaking, we only see a very sh small piece of the spectrum. 
Other creatures can see much more of the spectrum. Bees, for example, can see ultraviolet, which we cannot see. In fact, they navigate by the spectrums that we cannot even see. So if we get new eyes with new potentials, then maybe we can see all the way from the, the one extreme to the other. Maybe we'll even have X-ray possibilities to look right into a substance or an organism, to see the manifestations and the, and the workings of the biological machinery. Perhaps we can uh, focus. I have an interesting phenomenon myself. My two eyes are so different that uh, without glasses, it's very hard to see with both eyes. So if I want to see far, I have to close my right eye, and then I see perfectly with my left eye. But if I close my left eye, I cannot see anything far away. But I have a microscope. I can see very small letters at one focal length with that eye. So maybe we will have the capacity to have that accommodation and actually be able to not only have telescopic vision, but also microscopic vision. I'm looking forward to those new eyes, Francis. You remember we talked to Ilse. She's doing research on autistic children. <clears throat> yes. And can you remember what she said? What they see and we don't see. I can't remember, but you can enlighten me. Yeah. They, they can see much more than we. More colors, more movements in uh, the... The clouds, for instance. Uh, and yeah, the brain has a tremendous capacity that we seem to have lost. So when the full potential is again realized, heaven will be an amazing place. Kainos eyes. What about ears, Walter? Do we pick up all the, the sounds with our ears? No, well, that's why they use animals to do the jobs that we cannot do. So we know that ears are designed to do much more than ours can do. So probably with sin, a lot of the capacities that we have were lost. So if we have the ears and the eyes that have capacities as some of the, like an eagle, for example, it can be flying a kilometer up in the air and spot a rodent the nose sticking out of a bush from that height. And we can't even see it when we're walking right by it. So these will be fantastic. And if you think of echolocation and all of these things. And it's interesting that people that, that lose one of their senses, let's say the sense of sight, their ears actually take up the slack. And they can hear things which no one else can hear. And there are people that walk without a cane by echolocation, mm. by making clicking sounds Isn't and that taking the bouncing effects, which you have to train your system in order to achieve it. So we will, we will have capacities which are beyond all expectations. And then it also says that in that new setting, we shall go wheresoever the Lamb goeth. Mm. Now, if he's the king of the universe, I believe that we will go on universal visits. So we will see the cosmos in its beauty. Just think how much time and energy scientists spend in trying to f unfathom the mysteries of the universe. And at what expense we go from here to the moon. Uh, I think that kind of travel will be rather different. And then there's another capacity. And we read some of these things in the Bible, and people will think oh, this is mythology. But this is not mythology, this is science. We are constantly trying to, to enter into different states. And uh, the science of wormholes, for example, where you can move from one dimension to another, 
or to outwit the constraints of speed, which is now subject to a maximum of the speed of light, how about moving with the speed of thought? Mm. And if you look at the Bible, you have angels traveling instantly. While you were still thinking, Gabriel had come. Now, at what distance did he come? Certainly he wasn't traveling at a limited speed. But you even had humans doing that. If you take Philip, for example, he was running behind the chariot, got onto the chariot, and was teaching the eunuch out of the book of Isaiah, baptized him, and in the next instant he was transported somewhere else. So uh, your movies like Star Trek and all of these pick up on these things and beam people up and beam people down. Scientifically speaking, that might not be so impossible. So if we have glimpses of possibilities even in this world, I'm looking forward to what it will be like in that world. You know, Walter, I looked at the Greek, the New Testament, the Koine Greek, and I, I discovered that sometimes when God speaks, it's music. It's music. Well, did you know that the yeah. animal kingdom has a sense of music? The animal kingdom? The animal kingdom has a sense of music. It's uh, like a symphony orchestra when you put it together. Ah. Oh. But we've lost a lot of it through deterioration, so some of the notes are missing. It's like, a, like an instrument with uh, half the notes gone, so you have to sort of put it together from what there is. Now, kainos, the new smell, do you think we will smell differently in heaven? What will the I hope aroma be? I hope some of the smells that we have on earth will not be present in the new world. <laughs> or else, with our super sense of smell, it might become objectionable. <laughs> and tell me our taste buds. Will this also be kainos, this new kind of taste buds? Well, eye has not seen nor ear has heard the wonders that God has prepared for those that love him. It will be out of this world. Well, now I'm looking forward to a place where everybody will love me. <laughs> it's going to be very hard to do, Francois, but we'll, we'll work at it. <laughs> Dear viewer, God has gone to prepare a place for you. Should you be lost... He'll be lonesome forever. Please don't do it to him.